Hello and welcome to episode two in our new series of interviews we call The Office Briefing. I'm Richard Quartz, Chief Executive of the British Council for Offices, the BCO, and my guest today is Rory Sutherland. So welcome, Rory. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolute delight. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you, Rory. I'm very grateful to you for very kindly agreeing to spend some time with me for a chat. Now, for those who may not no, Rory, he's vice chairman at the media and ad company Ogilvy UK. <coughs> His accounts over the years have included American Express, Royal Mail, and what was then a relatively obscure software company called Microsoft, something we might touch upon if we have time. Now, Rory's specialism is behaviors as individuals and groups, consumers and employees and how we often make the wrong decisions or the decisions that perhaps others want us to make. Rory's also the wiki man in the Spectator Essential reading for any sensible individual. So a lot to talk about and let's go straight to questions, Rory. And my first question is on the theme of technology. So Rory, why has it taken the coronavirus pandemic to get us all to use Zoom, Teams and the like, when video conferencing has been around for years. My vague hunch is that we might have adopted this tech, we would have adopted this technology eventually, okay, to the extent that we have. I mean, this is a very artificial experiment, by the way. So this isn't flexible working, it's imposed home working. And even complete kind of evangelists like me wouldn't have proposed uh, being at home for five days a week uh, and that... Um, uh, you never visit the office or co-locate with your team at all. I mean, that, it, it's an absurd experiment. What I think the experiment has revealed is that it's more effective than we would have expected. Now, in the future, of course, a flexible working means not necessarily working from home or not necessarily from the office. It also uh, means that you're perfectly free to come into an office. Bear in mind that a lot of people in smaller households or with young children actually need their office as an escape from home. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a fair experiment. I think it would have happened anyway, but I think it might have taken 10 to 20 years. In fact, the Department for Transport built into their models of transport demand the assumption that video conferencing would start to eat away at business travel fairly significantly. But all those projections were about 10 years in the future. And what sometimes happens with a technology is that it doesn't really deliver its benefits until it's at critical mass. So a very small parallel to this was the thing that catapulted the fact that Half your listeners are going to be going, what the hell's granddad on about here? Okay, but those of those of us, I think I can safely say us here, Richard, those of us who can remember the fax machine, um, that actually was a technology that existed in the 19th century. Okay, it was available commercially quite easily in the 1970s. It was very slow and very expensive. That's one point to make, but it did exist. Um, however, very few people had fax machines. And I had a friend who had a fax machine in the 1970s. He had one in his London office, one in his Los Angeles office. And as far as he could remember, the only use he made of the machine was sending legal contracts from London to LA and back again. He can't remember faxing anybody else ever, I think. Um, but the interesting thing that catapulted it suddenly into the mainstream was partly uh, declining price, improving technology. Um, but the third thing was interesting, which was a series of postal strikes in the early 1980s, which led businesses to realise, OK, we need to have a, an alternative to sending things postally, so we better get one of these machines. And then, of course, once the machines proliferated, um, I think it's a thing, and I can't remember the name of the law, but it's effectively that the value of a network expands at the square of the number of nodes. And so uh, if you think about a telephone, if, you own, if there are only two telephones in the world, it's a not very useful technology. When there are a million, the number of people you can call and speak to goes up exponentially with every person you add to the network. And so um, what's really important, I think, there is that um, uh, this was a case where something that probably would have happened very slowly over time uh, just happened very, very rapidly. Now, there will be, there will be of course, a counter revolution in that people once vaccinated uh, you know will be free to come back and I think will make up for lost time to some degree with socializing but I don't think the patterns of travel in business in general and I've included air travel in this I don't think they're going to revert 
Okay, and part of the reason for that is psychological. It's not technological. It's not to do with network economics, but it's simply the question of social norms. Okay, if you are the one person who suggested a video conference in 2018 when everybody else wanted to fly to Frankfurt, you were the weirdo. And even if you got your way, if the video conference went badly wrong, you got blamed for it. Flying to Frankfurt was the default behavior. If you flew to Frankfurt, by the way, all the flights were delayed and you ended up stuck at Heathrow for four hours. Nobody blamed you. Very interesting. And I often say in business decision making, in consumer decision making, people are trying to minimize the risk of regret. And in business decision making, people are trying to minimize the risk of blame. And therefore, going with the default behavior is always safe in business. You know, nobody would say, OK, we agree we're flying to Frankfurt, but then all the planes were delayed. You, you're an idiot because I said we should do a video conference because that was the minority opinion. And minority opinion is always unsafe in institutional decision making. Yeah, that is funny, Rory. And it does just to give you buddy, it does remind me of a personal experience when I was flying up for a committee lunch four or five years ago in Edinburgh and just for the day, just for a, flying for lunch and, and a cop to Heathrow, the flight was delayed and it, be, it became pointless. But then I had that bizarre experience of wanting to get off the flight because I realized it wasn't worth it, which is actually extremely difficult when you want to get off a flight. I, I had that when I was flying, funnily enough, to Edinburgh just before that storm hit. Do you remember that extraordinary storm? Now, the person who told me the dinner I was flying to was canceled. Did the unbelievably idiotic thing of sending me an email, which I'm obviously not going to check when I'm in the business of checking onto a flight. Fantastically, my PA spotted this email and texted me. And you're right, I had to retrieve my luggage. Um, uh, and um, basically, I would have been trapped in Scotland for three days because the sleeper trains were all cancelled because there were trees across the line. You know, there was some absolute kind of cataclysmic event climatically. And so um, uh, you're absolutely right. The other thing I think is that we don't perceive things according to what they are. We perceive things according to what we compare them to, okay? And this is a really important psychological bias. One thing is that, um, uh, just to give a, a, an example, um, when I traveled into London during lockdown, which was to record something at a studio, I drove into London and for the first time ever, this was just a normal part of my working life, driving into London to record something, okay? And for the first time in my life, I remember thinking, this is kind of ridiculous, okay? Because I'm, I'm putting in three hours in the car in order for one hour of useful work. This is kind of nuts. You know, I'm gonna get home to a full email inbox because I've been sitting in the car, unable to do anything, okay? And I always remember this, that when I get back from holiday, if I'd spent a holiday in France, for the first week, London traffic would strike me as absolutely infuriating. And then I'd just get used to it again. I'd just go, okay, that's normal. You know, I can remember having an apoplectic fit on the first day back from a holiday in France, because I got used to the fact that you got in your car, you drove to where you wanted to go, you had the meal, you drove back. And suddenly here we were wrestling with the Blackwall Tunnel. And I don't think those one day trips to Frankfurt or those trips up to Edinburgh for a lunch I don't think they're going to happen uh, I, to anything like the previous extent. I think you're right, Rory. I think is the, the business travel will be a lasting consequence. And that's something I think we, we might come on to later. And it, it is bizarre when you try and do something against the norm. And it's actually very complicated to get off an aeroplane before it's left left the ground but it's actually left to stand but it's not going anywhere because there, there isn't a sort of a setup for that and it's it's very strange but i want to move on i think you have the legal right to demand it don't you technically i well, think if the plane hasn't pushed back you do have a legal right to say i want to get off the aircraft David Ogilvy, who was terrified of flying, by the way, the founder of Ogilvy, uh, was known for doing this. If the weather was bad, he'd suddenly have a panic attack on the plane and just demand to leave. How interesting. And, yeah. it, and there, it's something that doesn't sort of fit into the, into the pattern of how the airlines operate. But when you reach the conclusion, this is, this is going to be entirely counterproductive, I just want to go there isn't a setup to do. I, I want to move on there, Roy, if I may, because my, my next thing is the return to the office. And we've touched on yeah. some of the, but, but I think we would absolutely agree that, 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 that few, few of us imagine that working patterns of those usually based in offices will revert to those found in the pre-pandemic world. Most of us see some sort of hybrid model of splitting work between the the week between the office and the home. So is that is that right? And if it is, 
what will the office of the future have to offer and how will it look and feel? Um, my hope is that first of all, we have to accept, I, okay, this is slightly controversial. I think the whole mythology of the open plan office was actually literally that, a myth. And this is my criticism of the open plan office. It was sold on a lot, lot of nonsense about team working, okay, which is plausible. There's a great phrase by my colleague in New York, Chris Graves, who says, just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's true. OK, now, in theory, having a lot of people sitting in an open plan office should aid both you know, rapid transfer of information and serendipitous encounters, OK, which are two of the justifications for the office. Right now, actually, empirically, the open plan office is very bad at both of these because you can't talk. In fact, the, the propensity for people to send emails to their near neighbours goes up when they're in an open plan office, because they have nowhere private to speak. Now, when I say private, that doesn't mean that what they're talking about is necessarily secret. Um, but what it does mean is that they want to be able to talk freely without disturbing the other person next door. And actually, if you look at an open plan office, you'll see a load of people wearing headphones, okay? Then you'll see a load of people um, who are trying to engage in a conversation in very muttered tones. And then you'll hear see a third group of people who are irritated by the noise generated by the mutterers, okay? So the first thing I'd say about the new office is it has to be much more, I was going to say bipolar, okay? Because there are two reasons you might go into an office, one of which is for all those highly sociable things, um, uh, you know, uh, serendipitous encounters, uh, casual conversations, uh, very rapid uh, exchange of information. And the other one is the complete opposite, which is escape from a noisy home where you've got a nightmare flatmate or some young kids, okay? And you're also, in future, of course, you'll be competing with other things like cafes, and possibly weird little remote working spaces out of London for people who can't be bothered to commute, but don't want to work alone. And so my argument is that the office needs to be, the future office needs to be half pub, half library. <laughs> and, and, and I use this phrase, and I, amusingly, I use it in a presentation to some people from AB InBev, who are of course a brewer. Now, one thing I can give a bit of work advice is if you're gonna work for a large company, work for a brewer because actually, you know, their business is all about having a good time, you know, so there's an agreeable lack of 21st century American Puritanism imposed on the work ethic, and well, the, the work culture, not the ethic. Um, uh, if you work for a brewer, I'd always, I'd always recommend that, you know, when in doubt, go and work for a booze company. They're also incredibly civilized, intelligent people. There's a hell of a lot to be said for them. But the funny thing is the people from ABN have said, actually, that pretty much describes our office as it is now. So one lesson will be to go to a large brewing firm and go and look at what they do, because it's half pub, half library. And, I, and I've even ma maintained that what we ought to have is, just as we always had this vision of the paperless office, we should have a screenless office, which is literally part of the office or a day of the week, because you can partition things chronologically or spatially, where you know there's no email, there are no screens. In other words, you can just talk there and you know that someone you're talking to is not intent on staring at their email in tray and you can actually have a conversation. And um, uh, so it's really interesting because I think I, I genuinely think that whole open plan office thing was done for essentially for economic reasons. How can we cram more people into the available space? Um, and I, I think the story that was told to justify it was entirely spurious. Yeah. I okay. Very um, interesting, Roy. And just uh, I, I, on the open plan thing and the headphones, I, we all see that so many times. And I couldn't agree more. I love your half pub, half library analogy. And it sort of takes me back. My first proper job, there was not a pub, but there was a bar in, in, the, in the building that was, you know, the, 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 the centre of gravity for so much yeah. activity. And, and then I think of, of uh, for some reason, I think of the old I never went in it, but the old MI5 building in, in Curzon Street um, before it was demolished had um, had its own pub in the building. And, and the, the principal reason because they didn't want anyone to, to go out to any of the pubs round about and spill the beans, but never underestimate the importance of the British pub uh, to, to the office workforce. Um, I, I'm going to move on, Rory, if I may, because and we've touched on some of these things, but the next one is travel and specifically the journey to work. We've talked about business travel, but, but coming back to the journey to work. Now, for many people, commuting is absolutely the most unattractive aspect of office life. Getting up stupidly early for a long, expensive journey only to do the same thing at the end of the day. 
So if there really is a permanent shift to different working patterns, what do you think the impact will be on infrastructure planning? For well, example, will we still have the same number of trains, but have more comfortable journeys because more people will travel at more sensible times? Well, very interestingly, what we if if we take advantage of this to some extent, okay. There's one person who works with Douglas McWilliams, who founded the Centre for Economic and Business Research, and he's a very, very good transport economist who understands the psychology alongside the logistics, and not many people understand both. If we actually adopt this technology intelligently, um, we have been gifted, at no cost, a 21st century rail network and a 21st century road network, because all you need to do is reduce the extreme peak period travel and the rest of the network is actually very much fit for purpose in fact we should spend less money on road building perhaps and more money on getting rid of potholes uh, which is a seven oaks residence is a particularly acute uh, concern uh, since my replacement tire bills are a large part of my motoring costs but um the interesting thing there is that if you can it's rather like energy the best way to first reduce carbon emissions is to get rid of the peak periods of heavy load because if you can persuade people to put their tumble dryers on at 11 o'clock at night when they're half nuclear powered, OK, rather than put them on at six o'clock when it causes a coal fired power station to be kicked into operation, you can make a large amount of difference simply by time shifting. Now, we're going to see a reduction in demand. The second thing we're going to see is, is, is an increase in time shifting. Uh, uh, one of the things I said to my PA is, look, OK, I'm going to be down in Deal for a chunk of the summer. Um, I don't mind coming into London. We'll concentrate that into one or two days of the week and uh, no, nothing before 10.45, if you don't mind. OK, now, interestingly, um, I was an adopter of time shift uh, working. I, I, I don't want to sound like some sort of you know extraordinary prophet here, but I was fascinated by Zoom, a very, very clever person in Ogilvy IT, took out an Ogilvy Zoom account about three years ago, quite early. And I suddenly noticed, and it's important to remember this, we've had video conferencing for years, but there were psychological and technological weaknesses in that Skype wasn't quite good enough. Most of the technologies weren't quite there, okay? And I think Zoom just crossed the threshold of crappiness, where you expected things to work rather than waiting for things to go wrong. But also, if you think about it, the model of a lot of early video conferencing was modeled on the phone call, which is you ring somebody else through video. Now, in a business setting, that's completely inappropriate, okay? I would no more video call the chief executive of Rolls-Royce, okay, than I would dress up in a clown costume and jump into his office and shout, surprise, okay? It's a, <laughs> it's a completely inappropriate behavior. And one of the clever things Zoom did is it created the model of the meeting space, the neutral space, to which everybody else attaches. It was also cloud-based technology, so it was much better at handling um, the processing and much better at scaling as well. And I was an early adopter of this. Uh, the first thing I noticed is it was not enough to say to my team, by the way, I'm really happy for you to work flexibly over Zoom, because they still saw that as a privilege and they felt they were burning reputational brownie points every time they took advantage of it. And I said to them, I said, no, you're not quite understanding me. It's not that you're free to work from home as a special privilege. I actively want you to work flexibly some of the time, because I think if you vary your working environment, you'll do better work. And actually, to be honest, under lockdown, people have often said, oh, what about the creativity? Well, we're a creative organisation. Actually, we've produced some of our best work, I think, under lockdown. I, I don't think there's been a net negative. Um, and it's much easier to get people together in the same place when it's virtual. You know, you don't have the problem, I'm afraid, Rory's in Amsterdam on Wednesday, so that's kicked him out for this meeting, right? Um, so the interesting thing I also did, which nobody else did, was I used to work from home in the morning and do all the emails and geographically neutral stuff, and then I'd travel in on an empty southeastern train. Now, one of the things I said to one of our rail company clients is, actually, you should think about expanding first class here, okay? Don't necessarily make it 50% more expensive. Maybe it's five pounds per day or 10 pounds per day and you get a guaranteed table, okay? Because the train is now an office. And my argument was that if I worked at home then traveled in on a train at 10 o'clock, I got 40 minutes work done on the train. If I traveled in on the train at 8.30, I got naught minutes work done on the train because it was too crowded to actually get out a laptop and do anything serious, okay? 
And so this time shifting business is another factor which we need to, you know, I mean, at some level, it's simply, inter I'll put it very beautifully, which I think is a very simple way of doing it, okay. We always assume, labour economics always assume that people sacrifice leisure for salary. That's how labour economics works. You sacrifice time, they pay you money, okay. And I think we've discovered that two things that employees value just as highly as uh, free time or money might be free where and free when. And my colleague, Brian Featherstone Hall, who's a brilliant sort of um, talent guru in New York, he said, there's also free who, the freedom to work with who you like, when you like, where you like, is actually perhaps more valuable than the freedom to work less. But there's another huge advantage, okay, which is if you give your employees free where and free when, it's a pay rise, effectively, that nobody can tax, right? Now, if, if it goes further and your employees are now free to live in um, Canterbury or Margate, rather than having to live in central London, it is literally a 30% pay rise in terms of reduced accommodation costs, okay? Because I'm conscious of the fact that it was fine for me, it was fine for you. We moved to London. We didn't make the absolute killing um, that we might have done if we'd been 10 years older. OK, where we would have bought a four bedroom flat in Clapham for thirty five thousand pounds. Right. If I moved to London and then become reasonably, tolerably prosperous in 1987 rather than 1995, which is when I that was when I kind of got into the property market a bit. OK, because, OK, uh, you know, I would have made an absolute killing. OK, as it was, I surfed the wave perfectly happily. I suddenly realised that our younger staff, after we pay them, 50 percent, 45 percent, 40 percent of the money goes in tax. Um, after they paid the tax, 50 percent of the remainder goes in transportation costs and in um, accommodation costs. And that isn't even including the cost of their office space, by the way, the overheads that we, we have to incur by just providing them with an office. So the amount of the money I've got to earn, the kind of 800 pounds, practically, to reward a member of staff with a discretionary 150. It's not a great way to run a business because I should be running a business to enrich our shareholders and to enrich our employees. And I'm actually running a business to enrich London's buy to let landlords, to be absolutely honest. One of the things I've been interestingly campaigning for for years, which is now going to get instigated, it wasn't me who started it, it was an organisation called the Campaign for Better Transport, is part-time season tickets. Okay, The season ticket is a Victorian um, notion which assumes that you travel up on the same train five days a week. I also think there needs to be an off-peak season ticket. Now that could be a bargain, okay? You know, I've actually suggested that when you, when you talk to property developers in, you know, in areas around London, you should have a product where you can bundle in six years of free off-peak travel into London as part of the purchase price of the house. Very, that is an interesting idea. And off-peak, flexible mm. travel cards, season tickets, all the rest of it, I could not agree more. It, the, it's an antediluvian. I, it, was, it was incredibly unfair to part-time workers to begin with, you see. Yeah. The people who are only working three days a week had to pay, pay full fare on every journey they made. I'm going to move on, Rory, if, if yeah. I may. Because my next theme is, is what I've called people and company. And you've touched on a bit of this, but... But most of us are social beings and simply like being with other people. So even if a business can undertake many or possibly most activities through remote access, being in the office with your colleagues for at least some of the time, yep. for most of us is more fun. So how does a business measure that value proposition against a clinical reduction in property costs? Okay, so this first answer is, I've got to be very conscious of the fact that there's a massive age bias here, which is, as you get older, your children are either, they've either left home or they're comparatively sane, by which I mean, you know, my daughters are 19 and they don't generally poo themselves in the middle of a Zoom call, okay? Um, you know, I, I hope not, okay? So, so your children are either left home or at least are biddable, okay? That's the first thing. Secondly, your commute is probably longer, your house is probably nicer, and your need for establishing networks is lower. And also you're probably married, so you don't need a big city quite for the same Darwinian reasons that a young person might, which is essentially, <laughs> as I often ask my, I often ask my colleagues, you could actually afford quite nice property in Bromley or Sevenoaks. You do realise that, don't you? And they go, effectively, I keep asking them, why will nobody under 30 ever live in suburbia if you put a gun to their head? 
you know, never mind commuter land, they won't even live in suburbia. And part of it, I think, if we're being brutal, is if you live in Bromley, you can't pull. <laughs> OK, I, I think it really is as crude as that. I think that, you know, if you say, do you fancy coming back to my place in Shoreditch for coffee? OK, <laughs> the person goes, well, if it turns out he's a nutter with a huge collection of Nazi memorabilia, it's just a quick cab home, right? OK, in Bromley, it's 60 quid. What do I do there? So I've always had this hunch that a large part of the property market is driven because London is a kind of, uh, you know, mating pool for younger people. And also you need to establish coalitions much more because nobody knows who you are. You need to signal more. You know, people kind of know who I am, right? I'm 55, you know, um, where, you know, um, whereas if you're younger, you need all that extraordinary kind of information exchange. Now, um, so, so there's an enormous difference, I think, between older employees and younger ones. I, I think that's highly significant in terms of where they want to live and in terms of their need for the office to a great extent. I, I, I agree, Rory. And, and the whole sort of experience over the last year, you know, those of us who are, you know, we're, we're a very similar age and, and those of us who yeah. you know, have some space and, and, and sort of quiet and, and, and can work and, and are established and have networks and all the rest of it, very different experience from the young living in cramped shared flats and, and all and all the rest of it but I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna you've mentioned london rory and i'm that's my next thing i'm going to move on to that if mm. i may and so towns and cities and london specifically so so as offices around the country stood empty or at least partly empty for much of the last year there was rightly a, a wide-ranging debate on the broader economic consequences yeah and most of us would accept that offices act as anchors for towns and cities. And if the office workers return in a different pattern, which seems quite likely, there could be a permanent shift in demand for ancillary services like cafes and sandwich bars and dry cleaners and the so, like. Uh, so, one, one technology we haven't yet mastered because the, the, the pandemic hasn't forced us to master it is the hybrid meeting, by the way where you have four people co-located and three people remote. Now there's a technology which I'm not paid to do this, I promise, but I will happily evangelize, which is the meeting hour. It is a plug, Rory. It is, it is a plug, but it's an unpaid plug. Okay. Uh, the meeting owl is a kind of AI powered device which sits in the middle of the table with microphones and speakers and actually cleverly acts as a webcam as far as your computer is concerned, but it zooms in on whoever's speaking. So it allows people to attend remotely a co-located meeting and feel as if they're participating well, in a far better way than forcing everybody to sit as if they're on a bus facing a screen, which is unnatural. You know, humans have sat in circles for probably half a million years, you know, around a fire originally. Now it's a table, okay. And the meeting owl, there's one other technology, I think Norwegian one, uh, which I think might be called Huddle, but there are only a couple of technologies that, are, that don't cost 5,000 pounds. Uh, this costs, you know, 900 that really allow you to do it. And interestingly, um, that, you know, I was talking to the people at Meeting Owl because I'm just a, a, you know, kind of evangelist for them, albeit unpaid. And they said they were getting sort of million dollar orders from the Texas Department of Education. They were getting huge orders from NASA, you know, um, and NASA were ordering these things because they realized that um, uh, this hybrid meeting was going to be a large part of the future. Because well, one thing we must remember, by the way, and I always get a bit cross when people go, ah, oh, but the thing about Zoom is it's not as good as a physical meeting. But there you're looking at the visible cost, not the opportunity cost. Because I've often said in those meetings, you said it's not as good as a real meeting. Yes, but you're in Delhi and the other guys in Madison, Wisconsin, okay? For us to meet would take six months to organize and cost $7,000. And in all likelihood, the meeting would never have happened. So we've got to remember that Zoom facilitates, whereas the office facilitates serendipitous encounters between you and your staff, the Zoom world facilitates spectacular serendipitous encounters between you and people all over the world who might be clients or might be employees. Now, I can I think that's bang on. I agree because it has yeah. a, the, the, the world in a way that's never been possible before. So costs, costs are always much more salient than opportunity costs. And the assumption that you had to meet physically before you engaged in any business activity of, you know, of, of five figures or more imposed an enormous opportunity cost and an enormous geographical um, cost, I think, uh, in terms of land value uh, on uh, on business. So, I mean, Two stories, Coke is currently recruiting for people in their global marketing team, okay? There is no longer any assumption that you'll move to Atlanta to take up your role, okay? 
And the second thing is, I think that um, uh, it's worth looking at the nature of networks, air networks, rail networks, road networks to an extent, are the kind of network where your location on the network determines the value you derive from the network as a whole. So you derive much more value from trains if you live in London, where the trains go everywhere, okay, <coughs> than if you live in West Wales, where there's only one place you can go by train, which is east, okay. Similarly, if you live next to Birmingham Airport, it's much less valuable than being next to Heathrow Airport, right, because that's the nature of the hub and spoke nature of transport networks. Now, two networks, at least, aren't like that. The postal network, you know, the Amazon isn't much more valuable to you if you live in London than if you live in Ochtermachty or, you know, uh, or Cornwall. OK, if you live in the far north of Scotland, your Amazon Prime stuff arrives two days late, you know, two days after it's due, uh, after you order it, not one day. But basically, your location in the UK is irrelevant to the value you derive from both the postal network and the Internet, right? So what you have, in a sense, is that rail networks, air networks, to some extent road networks, are highly centripetal, whereas the force of the postal network is centrifugal, and, the, and, and even more so, the force of the internet is centrifugal. That essentially, it doesn't paying the premium to be at a network node is worth it if you've got a lot of frequent flyers or a lot of international business. You need to be near one of seven super global airports. Okay. Yeah. It's very interesting, right? And I'm going to draw you back, if I may. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry, I always need to be drawn back. I'm, I'm, I'm well, wrong. Irrelevant. It's really hard yeah. time to manage, but I will, I will do my best just to get the second bit of this theme in because I'm conscious of time. But so, as, as towns, towns and cities have, have long been very good at, at reinventing themselves, and possibly few as as much as mega cities like London, which is still the engine of the of the UK economy. Yeah. So looking specifically at, at London. Do you think there'll be a permanent impact on London as a consequence of this? And if so, what might the capital of the future look like? I mean, I mean one of the interesting things is, do we share offices, not geographically, but chronologically? So, you know, you could have office space. I, I mean, I hate to say this because I imagine quite a few of your people are, are, are commercial property investors. But, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday are Ogilvy days at Sea Containers House. Right. And that my relationship with London becomes like my grandfather's relationship with Abergavenny. He was a farmer. OK, which is it's a place you go once a week on market day. That's one extreme, by the way. OK, you know, the other extreme is that you can undoubtedly probably the case for hot desking strengthens because you can reasonably assume that not everybody's going to be. On the other hand, you could argue that the one essential thing is every now and then to get everybody in the same place. This is why I suggest that some degree of chronological sharing might be necessary. You'll need to um, redesign the environment so that there are kind of secluded spaces and social spaces, so that it's much more variegated than the, you know, ranks and ranks of open plan space, which doesn't allow you to find a place to suit your temperament. I mean, famously, David Ogilvy never wrote a single thing in the office. He always went home. Um, and that, that was when he probably had an office with two PAs and, you know, those funny phones that you could press different buttons. You know, he, I'm sure he had adequate protection from interruptions, but David Ogilvy still went home if he had to write an ad. Um, and so uh, understanding that, that we need to create a, a greater choice of space for people to occupy. But at some point, you know, large co-location of teams will still be necessary. And then one of my contentions is let's make one of the... One of those Wednesdays, I said to my team, every other Wednesday, let, let's forget the paperless office, let's make it a screen-free office. Let's just go in on Wednesday and the deal is, okay, uh, no email except between, you know, one and three or something, okay? The rest of the time you have to spend talking to everybody. And um, uh, you know, what's the problem? I never understand people who go into the office early to do email, right? You could have answered it two hours earlier, right? If you just started when you got up in the morning, the screen isn't any different when it's in the office than when it's at home. What are you going into an office to do email for? Your broadband is probably better at home than it is in the office. It's certainly less, you know, crank, you know, it's, it's less prone to outages. OK, and so there is, a, you know, there is a lot of past behaviour, which is kind of absurd. OK, but then one of the things I say is, OK, every Tuesday, right, we're not just going to go into the office. We're in the office. We're going to talk a hell of a lot. and We're going to go out for a curry afterwards. Not mandatory. Well, although, you know, I treat employees who don't like Indian food with mild suspicion, to be honest. <laughs> 
Um, but, um, uh, you know, it's a bit of my deal breaker. Mm, I'm not really sure about this. Um, but, um, uh, but, but um, you know, actually, you know, we can actually turn this into, Nassim Taleb taught me this, that actually a lot of the answers to questions aren't in the average, they're in the variance. And quite often you need more of the two extremes and less of the average. And the open plan office is the classic case to solve for the average, which actually solves for a mode of work that doesn't really exist, which is semi-sociable, semi-secluded. There's not, you know, we all know jobs where we want to go away and lock ourselves in a room. We all know jobs where we want to go to a cafe, which is where you don't want to be disturbed, but you want a bit of background hum. OK, you know, I, I get the cafe, I get the library, I get the pub. OK, all of those things are really old. The open plan office is really an invention around cost accounting, which has been sold to people on the basis of productivity without any empirical evidence to support it. Very interesting, Rory. And it is it is strange how, you know, it takes an extraordinary global shock like this to, to stop us to doing things that we all did mm. that were actually, you know, by any sort of rational analysis. Kind of dumb. They were kind of dumb, weren't they? Yeah. Completely bonkers when you when you look at it objectively, and as you say, you know the idea that you sort of get up stupidly early and and travel a great distance just to to type emails that you could easily do elsewhere. And I get the quiet point completely as well. And it's interesting again in the pre-pandemic world how people would want to work elsewhere when they needed peace and quiet to think and write, because that's hard to do in many in many modern environments. Oh, oh, oh. So also let's let's look at people who are introverts, retiring, disabled, okay, um, single parents, uh, recent parents, okay, paternity, maternity, okay. Now um, we can sort of reinvent all those things. We can reinvent retirement. Most people don't retire because they want to stop work. They retire because they want to stop commuting, right? You know, sixty-two-year-old accountant, impossible, implausible as it may seem, probably quite enjoys doing accountancy. Not five days a week, none of it means getting up at six o'clock in the morning and traveling on a crowded train. None of it means he can't go and work from his little cottage near a golf course in Portugal for two months of the year. But none of those things is now incompatible with doing 15 useful hours a week as an accountant, okay? We assumed they were necessary, but they weren't. I agree, and it sort of draws me onto my last question because sadly we are, Sorry, no. Pretty much out of time. But my last theme is, I've called it crystal balls. And let's hope it's, it's <laughs> crystal balls and not just balls. But great, great world events often lead to what we might call the law of unintended consequences. And for example, who would have imagined in the summer of 1914 that a little over four years later, most of the royal households of Europe would have disappeared. Russia yeah. would have had a communist revolution and America would be the world's... I can't remember who said it. It might have been no, Lenin or somebody who said... Oh, sorry. No, OK, yeah. To finish this and then, and then jump in. So, so gazing in to the Sutherland crystal ball, what do you think might be the unintended consequences of the last year as we begin to emerge from the pandemic? Um, this may not be what your membership wants to hear, but uh, if people who are older, okay, move out of London. I think the problem with London residential property is that everybody's in housing which is 10 years too young for them. And that, by the way, includes people aged 65 or 70 who are retired and still living as a couple in a four bedroom house, by the way. It doesn't just apply to property that's too small for them. There are a whole chunk of people whose property is too big for them, to be absolutely honest. OK, and so, you know, you have 25 year olds effectively living in student accommodation. You have 35 year olds effectively living in starter accommodation. Now, if there is a bit of an exodus of the elderly from London and it makes London more affordable. Now, this isn't me just saying this. This is another very interesting writer. A city. If London became a bit more like Berlin, where experimental real estate were available because because of the you mentioned, you know, uh, who would have predicted it? You know, Berlin was a very unusual property market because you could get extraordinarily inexpensive property in what was a world class city. OK, really anomalous. But the creativity that arises from having inexpensive real estate, which allows you to experiment. You see it in American strip malls. It was very weird. OK, you know, the American strip mall, you'll occasionally find an utterly fantastic Thai restaurant that's next to kind of like a donut shop at a Kinko's. Right. I always find it. You know, it's, it's very strange to me as a Brit, but 
Um, having that kind of experimental space, and if London becomes a bit young, younger as a city, to be honest, if it becomes a bit more edgier, a bit more creative, a bit less bourgeois, a bit less dominated by plutocrats, and actually becomes a bit more fun, my contention is that would benefit everybody in the long term. Interesting. Um, and more generally, Rory, do you see anything... I mean, this is crystal ball gazing, but but you know we're we're pretty much exactly a year in, into this from the, the first lockdown. As we emerge, do you see any sort of going outside our world, going outside property, any sort of radical, radically different changes? Uh, yeah, there's there's one huge uh, event, which is if you look at buy to let investing, it only really makes sense if you're getting capital gains. If we have a period of three years. There's a second thing, which is that Londoners, I think, are just weirdly. Now, this is where I think that economics gets it diametrically wrong. You'd think that as London property prices go up, the incentive for London property owners to move out rises. OK, that's what standard economics would say. I would say psychologically, because of fear of loss, loss aversion, for as long as London, the, your property is the only thing which you can leverage to the extent you can. If I go into my bank and say, I want to buy a quarter of a million dollars worth of IBM shares, they'll tell me to bugger off. If I say I want to spend 500,000 on property, they'll go, let's talk right now, okay? So the only way you can leverage yourself and get a huge tax-free gain in the UK market, okay, is basically through property. And so Londoners are terrified of moving out for fear that they miss a future 10% of gain, okay? They're also frightened that if they do move out, they'll never be able to afford to move back in again. So there's also that paranoia. Now, if you did have three years of declining residential property cost, a hell of a lot of buy to let investors are going to move out of the market. That's going to drive property down. A hell of a lot of people who already own are going to go, shit, now's my chance to make a, you know, to flee for the hills. OK, particularly combined with only two days of commuting cost plus, a, you know, a, an off peak season ticket. OK, if we see that you could see quite a large scale exodus. Now, that process will play out over a slower period than I've described. But all you need is for, I mean, buy to let investing, to be honest, if you don't actually, uh, if you don't actually get the capital gains is a bit of a mugs game. Okay, okay. now that's, the, that's my residential prediction. In commercial property, um, first of all, really prime space, I think will hold up really, really well because it's a special occasion, it's market day, okay? You know, one of the greatest things we did in Ogilvy, by the way, is we moved from Canary Wharf to Sea Container's house. Um, and the, the glorious thing about that is we can always shrink because there'll always be another WPP company who's happy to move in because it looks over the river. OK. The possibility for creating kind of satellite offices is interesting. So, you know, I'm investigating co-working spaces in Kent and Kent Surrey borders, not just for me. I mean, this could be a room above a pub, but for 20 people I know and work with and have worked with for 10 years who also live vaguely locally, where we say, look, the days sometimes we'll work from home. Sometimes we can all meet up in this Wi-Fi equipped room above a pub and we can all just work together. OK, so that's another opportunity which might be necessary, actually, if you think about it, for reasons of resilience which is that if all your eggs are in one locational basket and another pandemic hits or some other major event, um, you don't really have the capacity to flex. But, but I mean, it could be very, very interesting. I mean, these movements play out very, very slowly. And often, you know, it's, it's five years too late before people spot the trend. But I can see some of this stuff happening. And I, I also say that, you know, really prime space actually holds up very well because you can always shrink it because there'll always be a need for that. I have to say, if I owned office space in kind of what you might call second rate turf, you know, I'd be a bit worried now, I have to say. No, I think that is that is very interesting, Roy. And I think, you know, we're all guessing, of course, uh, and won't know until it, it's over and, and uh, or largely over and settles down. But I think, you know, that a lot of the thinking of a flight to quality, you know, yes, I, I would say this, wouldn't I, of course, you know, yeah. Eddie, yeah, but but I think the office has an absolutely fantastic future, but it will have to be ever better. And I think, you know, that is something we are exceptionally good at doing in this country. We, we produce great space. Sea Containers House being a, a fantastic example. of. I, 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 and rem remember, I'm a huge advocate of flexible working, but I only had everybody else was discussing the furniture and the decor and everything else. And I only had one rider for our new office in Sea Containers, which is we've got to have a theatre. OK, 
we've got to have a space where 250 people can sit down and I can get an interesting guy in and everybody can watch it and they can all listen to the talk and they can all go to the pub afterwards or have a drink. Mm. Because that's, the, funnily enough, you know, it's the last thing that most offices want to put in because it looks like a ginormous waste of space. But actually, it, you know, that was my only, that, I, that was my only demand. Right. No, and it, it, it's a fabulous example of a reinvention of a, a very clever reinvention of a building, I think. And, and you know, your lovely restaurant on the, on the top with a view of the river and, and all the rest of it. But undoubtedly, there will be aspects of this that none of us have, have thought of yet. That no, we'll become... I completely agree. Thank you, Rory. Sadly, we are out of time. As I said, I'm extremely grateful to you. It's been a, a huge pleasure. And thank you very much. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed this interview as much as I have. And until next time, from Rory and from me, thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure. Anytime. Thank you so much, Richard.